Thank you. That concludes general questions. We will now move to First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. One week has passed since the unwarranted, unprovoked and illegal invasion of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin and his forces. One week of watching refugees forced to flee their homes, watching cities being bombed and a week of seeing young and old come together to fight on the front line in a war between two sovereign countries. And while we debate in this chamber, we cannot forget that the people of Ukraine continue to put up the most heroic defence of their country in the face of Russia's appalling actions. But they urgently need food, water, shelter and medical care. Today, I'll stand with fellow party leaders to show our support for the Disasters Emergency Committee's Ukraine appeal. The people of Ukraine need our help in their time of need, and I would encourage everyone across Scotland who can donate to do so, and together we can help make a real difference to the peoples whose lives have been devastated by this atrocity. Uh, First Minister, can I ask why did the Chief Executive of the Scottish National Investment Bank resign abruptly on Friday? First Minister. Uh, firstly, Presiding Officer, can I uh, also, on behalf, I am sure, of all of us in this chamber and across the country uh, express uh, my horror at the scenes we have watched unfold in Ukraine as a result of Putin's aggression and illegal invasion uh, over this past week, um, and also express uh, my admiration uh, of and solidarity with the people of Ukraine, uh, led, of course, uh, by their president. Uh, all of them are showing incredible bravery as they stand up for the values uh, of democracy uh, and sovereignty and freedom. Um, I also uh, want to uh, echo the comments made about the Disasters Emergency Committee appeal, which will launch uh, just after the session of First Minister's questions, and all party leaders will stand together to support uh, that. Uh, the Disasters Emergency Committee appeal brings together all of the leading aid agencies who are responding right now on the ground and donating to its Ukrainian appeal is the fastest and the most efficient way to get money to charities who are helping right now. Of the £4 million announced by the Scottish Government on Monday for humanitarian aid, I can confirm to Parliament that £2 million of that will go uh, to the Disasters Emergency Committee appeal. And before I move on uh, to Douglas Ross's question, can I just take the opportunity uh, to say to people that they can donate to this appeal uh, at dec.org.uk uh, or by telephoning at 0370 60 60 900 uh, or £10 can be donated by texting SUPPORT to 70150. Every penny donated from Scotland uh, will help to get much needed aid to the people of Ukraine who are fighting so hard for those uh, values that we all hold dear. Uh, presiding officer, on the question about the Scottish National Investment Bank, um, I am sure uh, that uh, everyone across the chamber will understand that I am not uh, going to go into the confidential details of anybody's uh, employment situation here in the chamber. Uh, this issue was not, is not a matter uh, for Scottish Government ministers. It is a matter for the board uh, of the Scottish National Investment uh, Bank. Ministers had no input uh, into uh, that, although we were told uh, earlier in February that the chief executive would be leaving the bank imminently. Uh, what is the responsibility of uh, Scottish Government ministers to ensure is that the bank is performing well and the bank is performing exceptionally well. It is perhaps the most important uh, economic initiative uh, that has been taken over the past few years in Scotland. Uh, and as of the end of January, the Scottish National Investment Bank had completed 13 investments, uh, totalling just under £200 million since its launch. Uh, supporting companies across its three uh, key missions of net zero, uh, place-based uh, development and innovation. The bank is doing incredibly well and the Scottish Government and I think all of Scotland should continue to support it in those efforts. Douglas Ross. The First Minister has used this opportunity to explain how well the bank is doing and the vital work they are undertaking and therefore I think it is important that this Parliament knows and the public in Scotland know why the Chief Executive resigned so abruptly earlier this week. We have heard from the First Minister that she was given advance warning of that last month. Uh, and therefore I have to ask why are we not finding out in this Parliament this week? Repeatedly Scottish Conservative MSPs have asked why Ely McTaggart, the Chief Executive, resigned. Not once did we get an answer, and again today the First Minister has refused. 
This bank will eventually be in charge of £2 billion of public money. Therefore, I think we are entitled to know about the leadership, because this secrecy and shutting down scrutiny is completely unacceptable. How can the First Minister and her government have nothing to say about why the person running that organisation has left? The ministerial quotes, quote, code states, and I quote, information should not be withheld from the public unless there are clear and lawful reasons for doing so. Are there clear legal reasons for hiding this information from the public, or will the First Minister now tell us while the Chief Executive stood down? First Minister. I would have thought the answer to uh, Douglas Ross's question uh, about the terms of the ministerial code uh, should have been uh, obvious. Uh, the bank's chief executive is an employee uh, of the Scottish National Investment Bank. Uh, the bank has a duty of care uh, to all staff, including uh, the former chief executive. Uh, that is why it is a matter for uh, the board of the bank, and it is important for everyone uh, including Scottish ministers, to respect that confidentiality and that duty of care. Uh, what is important is that, given that the Chief Executive has uh, resigned, and uh, I think it is uh, important to make this point, uh, that the Bank uh, has a new uh, interim leadership in place and the Bank continues to perform extremely uh, well. I have already outlined uh, the scale of the investments that are being made by the Bank, supporting businesses all over the country to help us meet the missions uh, of making Scotland a more innovative country, uh, of completing our journey to net zero uh, and uh, of ensuring place-based uh, development uh, to help some parts of the country uh, have better, faster economic growth. So that is what matters to this Parliament, it is what matters to the Government, and at any uh, given time it is vital uh, to be clear that the Bank has the leadership in place to ensure that continued progress. Douglas Ross. There are questions about the leadership of the Bank that were not getting answered by the First yeah. Minister. Yeah. She is yeah. telling us a lot about the, the Bank and the importance to Scotland and Scotland's economy yeah. and to this Parliament, but, like her ministers, is refusing to give any detail on why the Chief Executive resigned. And I think that is extremely unfortunate when we come to this Parliament to get answers from the First Minister and her government. Because the timing about this is, is all very suspicious. The Chief Executive of Scotland's National Investment Bank resigns just days before the SNP launched their own economic strategy. Yeah. A strategy that is wa wafer-thin, underwhelming and watered down by the Greens. It sums up a government that is out of ideas and out of any vision for creating yeah. Scottish jobs and growing our economy. This plan is more of the same. It even recycles productivity clubs from Derek Mackay's economic plan. Yeah. And it's been criticised by business leaders, including Sir Tom Hunter, who described it as a long wish list with no magic wand. Is it really a coincidence that the Chief Executive of the Investment Bank has resigned instead of trying to deliver this new strategy? First Minister. Yes, it is uh, a coincidence. Um, and that is clear. But can I... Uh, on the issue of the former chief executive, uh, the former chief executive of the Scottish National Investment Bank is a private individual. Uh, she has opted to resign her post uh, as chief executive of the bank. Uh, she is entitled to the duty of care and the confidentiality that any other uh, individual in uh, her circumstances would be entitled to. And it would be completely wrong, and I think most reasonable uh, people would accept, it would be completely wrong of me in the chamber of the Scottish Parliament to breach uh, that confidentiality. Uh, what I have a duty to make sure about is that the bank has uh, the right leadership in place and can continue to build on the excellent progress that the bank uh, is making across its three missions. Uh, that, I think, is what is important. And in terms of uh, the economic strategy published by uh, Kate Forbes earlier this week, uh, perhaps I just need to quote uh, some people uh, on the front line of uh, Scotland's economy. So Tracy Black from CBI Scotland Business will welcome the ambitions set out as the right path for Scotland's future economy. Uh, or Liz Cameron, Scottish Chambers of Commerce. Uh, businesses will applaud the scale First and ambitions Minister. set out in the strategy. First Minister, First Minister, sorry, if we could just um, ask you to pause for a moment. There's conversation going on across the aisles, and I'd be grateful if that could cease. First Minister. 
eh, or Ewan Macdonald Russell from the Scottish Retail Consortium. There is much in this strategy the retail industry can support. Eh, Andrew McRae, Federation of Small Businesses, the headline measures in this strategy could help Scotland realise its long-term ambitions. Uh, so that's what people out there uh, working in Scotland's economy uh, think. We'll continue to work with them as we continue to support recovery from COVID and make sure that the Scottish economy uh, is living up to and fulfilling its enormous potential. I have to wonder when the First Minister reads out these quotes if they were similar supportive quotes when Derek Mackay issued out many of the same uh, points in his economic plan and previous economic plans. Because the fact is, uh, this is a retread of many of the issues and ideas that were put forward uh, by the SNP uh, before. Uh, but uh, the first part of the answer was quite telling from the First Minister because she has confirmed to Parliament that there is no direct link between the government's economic strategy launch and the resignation of the Chief Executive of Scotland's National Investment Bank. Uh, therefore, she knows why the Chief Executive did resign. Yeah. She knows that's, yeah. the reason why she did, that's not the reason why she resigned. And, First Minister, we're just asking questions because we need answers, and it may be uncomfortable. And, and the groans from the SNP may be because they don't want these questions to be asked, but it is the job of opposition in this country to raise serious concerns when they come. But the First Minister also mentioned the economy. And for 15 years that her government has been in charge, Scotland's economy has been stuck. This government has created more problems than it's ever created jobs. We've seen one major failure after another, from Presswick Airport to Ferguson Shipyard to Bifab. And now, in this new strategy, the SNP are literally diagnosing pro problems that they themselves either created yeah. or made worse. Yeah. And the First Minister can't even rely on support on the benches behind her, because in response to the launch of her government's economic strategy, Maggie Chapman, MSP, said the Scottish Greens believe the focus on growth is outdated. The focus on growth is outdated? These are the same Greens that Nicola Sturgeon personally invited into her government, a party whose policy is actually to make Scotland poorer. Yeah. First Minister, is it any wonder that your government's economic plan is a shambles? First Minister. Presiding officer, based on today's performance by Douglas Ross, uh, I, I predict that the one thing we will not be seeing any growth in uh, in the uh, next few months or years is Scottish Conservatives' fortunes uh, across the country. He, he wants to dismiss the views of CBI Scotland, of the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, of the Scottish Retail Consortium, of the Federation of Small Businesses. Uh, I've set out their views on the economic strategy and I would uh, suspect that they perhaps speak for more people in terms of the Scottish economy than Douglas Ross uh, does. Let's also look at the performance of the Scottish economy. Of course, we have a massive challenge ahead of us, as all countries do, to recover the economy from COVID. But look uh, at the record over recent years. Uh, the Scottish economy outperforming the UK on productivity. Uh, we've seen a growth uh, in the number of employers paying uh, the accredited living wage. Uh, we saw our target to reduce youth unemployment uh, met, although, of course, with the COVID challenge now, we have established the Young Persons Guarantee. We've expanded uh, modern apprenticeships. We set out an infrastructure investment plan with over £26 billion of investments to drive a green recovery, create jobs, stimulate supply chains. Uh, support for uh, exporters has been delivered by this government in the face of Tory Brexit. Uh, of course, Scotland is now the only part of the UK with a positive trade balance in goods. And of course, Scotland has been the top UK destination for foreign direct investment outside of London for every single one of the past six years. That's the record of this government on the economy. And we look forward now to building on that, working in partnership with businesses the length and breadth of the country. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Officer, can I firstly join other party leaders in expressing our horror and heartbreak at the continually devastating scenes uh, we see in Ukraine? Um, and we unequivocally stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine in defence of democracy, of human rights uh, and their peace and freedom. And we again recognise the unjustifiable and unprovoked attack from Vladimir Putin and I would urge all governments across the world to do everything they can to put pressure on him and his regime. Um, I also want to pay tribute to the countless number of individuals and organisations across our country who have been doing collections over the last week, 
uh, thank them for everything they're doing. We all feel frustrated. We all feel like we want to act. Uh, and one way we can act is by supporting the Disasters Emergency Committee's appeal uh, on Ukraine. Uh, and the First Minister has already set out the details of how people can support that. They can go online to dec.org.uk and donate online, or they can text support to 70150. Uh, we will never forget the people of Ukraine and will continue to support them throughout this tragedy. Presiding officer, last week, data from Public Health Scotland confirmed there are now over 680,000 people on an NHS waiting list. That is one in eight Scots waiting for hospital appointments, diagnoses and procedures. This week, new workforce figures revealed there were over 6,600 vacant nursing and midwifery posts, the worst on record. The Royal College of Nursing report that staff feel they are asked to do more with less and care is hugely undermined by the lack of staff. This is a dangerous mix, growing waiting lists and record staff shortages. First Minister, after 15 years, why have you still failed to deliver a credible workforce plan for our NHS? First Minister. Uh, firstly, uh, waiting times have increased over the course of the pandemic. Uh, they have increased because uh, during COVID, the NHS has been able to see and treat uh, fewer non-COVID patients. However, as we now hopefully come out of COVID uh, and focusing on the NHS recovery plan, uh, we want to get the NHS uh, back onto a normal footing so that it can see patients more quickly and start to reduce those waiting times. And uh, the government is very focused on that. Um, in terms of staffing, uh, there are uh, serious recruitment challenges for the NHS in Scotland, as there is indeed for health services across the UK. Uh, of course, uh, Scotland uh, has, as a result of the actions taken by this government since 2007, uh, record staffing numbers uh, in place. And uh, the numbers I'm about to cite, presiding officer, uh, are exclusive of vacancies. Uh, so these are uh, staff actually in post. Uh, NHS staffing is up by 28,700 whole-time equivalents. That's a 22.6 percent uh, increase since uh, this government took office. That takes it to a record high. NHS Scotland has higher staffing per head than we see in NHS England, 28.5 whole-time equivalents uh, per 100,000 people here, compared to just 21.4 in England. Uh, nursing midwifery staffing is also at a record high, up by 14.5 per cent since this government uh, took office. Uh, so that's the action we have taken. Of course, the challenges we face now are even greater, and we're focused on meeting these. Investing in the well-being of our staff, uh, making sure that we don't lose staff from our National Health Service, that they are well supported, making sure that our agenda for change staff are the best paid anywhere in the UK, and of course, uh, working with NHS boards uh, on recruitment campaigns, because one of the big challenges we face is a shortage of labour exacerbated, of course, by Brexit. So we are focused on all of that in the NHS and, of course, across social care as well. So we'll continue to get on with the job of supporting our National Health Service as we go further into the recovery from COVID. Anna Sarwar. There were 450,000 people on an NHS waiting list before the pandemic. And the question is not if we have more staff, it's whether we have enough staff. And a failure to plan has consequences. If the First Minister doesn't want to listen to me, maybe she'll listen to one of those 680,000 patients. Ricky, a former minor, he has chronic spinal pain and needs regular spinal injections, but has been waiting nine months. As a result of his condition, he needs neurological treatment. He's been told he needs to wait at least a year for an appointment with a neurosurgeon and at least eight months to access an MRI scan. He is in so much pain that he's having to pay £300 per appointment with a private doctor. And things are now so bad, he is considering remortgaging his house to pay for the surgery he may need. First Minister, Ricky isn't alone. There are hundreds of thousands of people waiting for NHS treatment and struggling to cope. This undermines the very founding principles of our NHS. So, First Minister, warm words and quoting stats won't cut it. When will you wake up to the reality of facing too many Scots? First Minister. I'm actually setting out the actions the government has taken because I don't believe uh, Ricky's experience or the experience of anybody else uh, waiting too long for NHS treatment is 
acceptable. Uh, I think people understand uh, the in immense challenges uh, that have been faced by the NHS over the past two years. Uh, Anna Sarwar talks uh, with some justification about the, the wider challenges in the NHS and the pre-pandemic progress. But the fact is, we were making progress in reducing waiting times before the pandemic. So we'd seen, for example, uh, the numbers waiting over 12 weeks for outpatient appointments uh, before the pandemic had fallen by 32 per cent. The median wait for inpatient and day case treatment had fallen uh, by 8.3 per cent. Uh, that's the progress that was being made before the pandemic, and I think everybody understands the impact the pandemic has had. Uh, I don't believe uh, there are sufficient staff in the NHS, which is why uh, the SNP manifesto at the election this time last year committed uh, to an additional 1,500 uh, staff being recruited on top of the record number we already have in place, and we are working hard uh, to ensure that we can meet those uh, recruitment targets. Uh, so we are focused on the NHS recovery plan of building capacity in our NHS uh, by 10 per cent to help with that recovery process and making sure that existing staff are well supported, that they are as well paid uh, as we can deliver within our resources and that we recruit more NHS staff. Uh, so that's what we are getting on with. And I think what people across the country on waiting lists uh, or anybody else for that matter want to hear uh, is what the government is doing. And that is what I am setting out today and will continue to set out and indeed uh, continue to be held to account for. Anna Sarwar. The actions aren't good enough and they don't go far enough. Scottish Labour has modelled the government's NHS recovery plan that the First Minister just referenced and backed up by independent analysis of that modelling. Even if you manage to deliver all the promised increases to activity, waiting lists will actually still continue to grow. In four years' time, by the end of the government's recovery plan, there could be over 430,000 patients waiting for an outpatient appointment. That is 11,000 more than are waiting today. At the same time, and the same is true for inpatient procedures, under the government's plan, as many as 153,000 people could be on a waiting list. That is 30,000 more than are waiting today. A catch-up plan surely means less people rather than more people on a waiting list. After 15 years of ne neglecting our NHS, is the best the First Minister has to offer a flawed recovery plan that will actually make waiting lists longer? First Minister. No, and I, I, think, I think Anas uh, Sarwar's reference to Labour's modelling, and I'd be very interested uh, to see the basis of that, perhaps uh, shows uh, his uh, oversimplification uh, of the plans that are in place, because building capacity um, is a key part of the NHS recovery plan, but it is not the only uh, part. Also redesigning uh, and modernising how people uh, get care, making sure people are getting care as close to home as possible. Our investment recently, for exa example, in hospital at home, better for patients, better for the NHS. The redesign of urgent care uh, programme, making sure uh, that hospital stays legitimately and appropriately can be shorter, building up social care uh, so that fewer people end up in the NHS because the services they need are not there in the social care sector. So, uh, the 10 per cent increase in capacity, a really important plank of the recovery strategy, but uh, I would suggest to Anna Sarwar uh, that it is not the only part. So we're focused on finding the solutions. What was missing, and I appreciate he's in opposition and I'm in government, it's for the government to find solutions, but what was missing from all three of Anna Sarwar's questions there was a single suggestion uh, beyond what we are doing al already. Uh, we, we are taking the actions, we will continue to ensure that we are taking the proper actions to support our NHS into recovery uh, so that patients like Ricky uh, and the many others who are waiting too long for treatment right now get quicker treatment um, and that our NHS is on that sustainable basis for the future that we all want to see. I'm going to move to supplementaries. I'd be really grateful for short and succinct questions and responses. And I call Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister agree that Scottish communities have demonstrated that they are fully prepared and willing to engage in a resettlement scheme for Ukrainians that matches the scale and severity of the current crisis? And will the Scottish Government continue to push the UK Government to urgently implement a more ambitious scheme to support those fleeing this appalling war on our continent? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do, and I hope we will have uh, unity 
across the Chamber on that issue. Can I say, firstly, I, I support the actions that the UK Government has taken um, in the light of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, I think the sanctions uh, have been admirably tough. I, I think they can be tougher still, and I, I think the Prime Minister and the UK Government agree uh, with that. I also recognise uh, the movement that has been made on the issue of refugees over uh, the past few days, uh, but I think that can and needs, on a moral humanitarian basis, to go much further. The estimates uh, already are that we're getting uh, rapidly close to a million people already displaced from Ukraine as uh, they are fleeing the horror that is unfolding there. We, in common with countries across the democratic world, have a moral humanitarian obligation to play our part in addressing that. Uh, so I would appeal to the UK Government again today, appeal directly to the Prime Minister, uh, to follow the example of the Republic of Ireland, to follow the example now of the whole European Union and allow anyone fleeing the horror in Ukraine entry to the UK if they wish and let's deal with the paperwork later. Let's operate now first and foremost on the basis of that humanitarian obligation. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, Robert Habeck, the Economics Minister and member of the Green Party in Germany's ruling coalition, signalled that Germany will drop its opposition to German-based nuclear-generated energy. Now, if even the Greens in Germany see the sense in generating nuclear energy domestically, isn't it time for the Scottish Government to drop its ideological objection to Scottish-based nuclear generation in favour of a more informed scientific approach? First Minister. No, I, I think we should build our energy mix uh, based on Scotland's assets uh, and Scotland's priorities. So Germany, for example, doesn't have anywhere near the renewable potential that Scotland has and uh, for example offshore wind is a massive potential for Scotland so let's continue uh, to build our low carbon uh, renewable energy mix and do it in a way that is right for Scotland. Ross Greer. Thank you. Vladimir Leeson is one of the richest men in Russia and he's been on the US Treasury Department's Putin list of known Kremlin associates since 2018. He's also the owner of a 3,000 acre uh, estate here in Scotland at Abaraco. That estate has received just under £700,000 of agricultural subsidies between 2016 and 2019. Can I ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government will urgently review the agricultural payment system and any other relevant payment system to ensure that no member of the Russian elite, no Kremlin associate, is in receipt of public money here in Scotland? First Minister. Um, yes, uh, I will uh, ensure that that review happens. In fact, I can uh, advise uh, Parliament that I have sought urgent advice on the maximum possible action that the Scottish Government can take uh, within our powers against individuals and entities identifying as having close links with the Russian regime, whether or not they are currently on the UK sanctions list. Uh, options that will be examined uh, include, but are not limited to, ending support from the public purse and freezing or seizing assets in Scotland where that is uh, possible. And I, of course, will keep Parliament fully updated. I can also confirm to Parliament that the Scottish Government will today write an open letter to Scottish businesses and business organisations uh, asking them to ensure, uh, and it's of course a matter for businesses, but we will encourage them uh, beyond direct investments, which we would hope businesses would divest themselves of, uh, review operations for links and connections to Russia, however indirect, and then sever uh, those links. And I can tell Parliament the Scottish Government and our economic agencies will not support trade and investment activity with Russia. Uh, we will, of course, support businesses as they adapt to remove any and all links with Russia. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Tuesday, Don Fresh Seafood went into administration. The immediate closure of the Uddingston factory has plunged 200 workers into redundancy. And they feel betrayed after years of broken promises. They fear they won't get their wages this week, with Alistair Salveson, one of Scotland's wealthiest men, claiming there are no funds to pay them. The Bakers Food and Allied Workers Union are working tirelessly to support their members, and some thankfully have found other work this week. But with a cost of living crisis biting, no one should be shortchanged at this present time. One angry worker told me last night there was no Christmas bonus, no support through COVID, not even a slice of fish. What urgent action is the government taking to support these workers? Because the men and women who helped to feed the nation during the pandemic should not be forced to use food banks. First Minister. 
Um, I absolutely agree uh, with the sentiments of that question uh, and, uh, like others, uh, was very concerned to learn that Don French Holdings had entered administration and I would absolutely call for the fairest possible treatment uh, of workers of that company. Uh, Scottish Enterprise spoke with the administrators yesterday to better understand the situation um, and to provide whatever support it can, can to help uh, the business and, indeed, to help the workers. Affected, uh, we will work with the administrators to understand all potential options for the business going forward and explore all possibilities uh, to rescue jobs. And of course, the government's partnership action for continuing employment uh, pace will offer uh, any necessary support to the workforce that are affected and who may be facing redundancy. Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you, President Officer. Um, Don Fresh is in my constituency in Uddingston Bells Hill, and as Ms. Lennon referred to the vented administration this week, and that's despite concerted efforts by the Scottish Government, my own office, South Lanarkshire Council, and Scottish Enterprise to support a takeover deal that would have maintained the Uddingston operation and continued to employ every worker there. So, can I ask the Scottish Government what efforts will be made to, to revitalise those efforts to continue seafood production at Uddingston, and also what work will be going on locally to support those local workers who are really sadly facing redundancy currently? First Minister. Uh, can I thank Stephanie Callaghan uh, for that question? I can also take the opportunity to acknowledge uh, how active she and her office have been uh, on behalf of her constituents uh, on this issue. Uh, Scottish Enterprise and the Scottish Government will explore uh, and give support to the exploration of all possible options uh, that might uh, allow the business uh, to continue uh, in some form and, of course, uh, that might allow jobs to be uh, saved and protected. And, as I said in my earlier answer, in parallel to that, we will provide as much support as possible uh, to those workers who are affected and who might be facing a redundancy situation. And, of course, uh, the business minister would be happy to meet uh, with Stephanie Callaghan and, indeed, uh, with other MSPs uh, who cover uh, this area on a regional basis to keep them updated on these efforts. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A concerned constituent contacted me following appalling overcrowding on the Borders Rail last Saturday. The 10.30 train from Tweed Bank was cancelled and the 11.30 train had just two carriages with standing room only from Gala Shields. As a result, no fares were collected. Passengers were crammed in carriages with no social distancing and very limited mask wearing. The train couldn't pick up passengers on the route bypassing stations. First Minister, this is absolutely unacceptable. Why hasn't the Scottish Government implemented the changes promised to Borders Passenger Services years ago? First Minister. Uh, obviously, the situation that has been narrated there uh, does uh, seem to be unacceptable. I'm not uh, aware of the particular circumstances uh, that led to this uh, at the weekend, uh, but I will ask uh, ScotRail for an explanation and ask ScotRail uh, what actions they are taking uh, to avoid a repeat of that. And I will uh, ask the Transport Minister to write to the member uh, once we have that information. Question number three, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether update on the Scottish Government's plans to replace carers' allowance with a devolved benefit. First Minister. We published a consultation on Monday setting out proposals for how Scottish carers' assistance will improve support for more than 80,000 of Scotland's unpaid carers, uh, and that is, of course, in recognition of their vital contribution. Our proposals have been developed with carers uh, and support organisations, and the consultation is an opportunity for people to continue to shape this important benefit. It sets out how we will deliver an improved service, providing more stable support and also a new payment uh, worth £520 a year for those caring for more than one person. And of course, this is in addition to the Young Carer Grant and the Carers Allowance Supplement. We're working with the Department for Work and Pensions uh, right now to ensure that we can launch uh, and deliver this new benefit as quickly as possible. Miles Briggs. Um, I thank the First Minister for that answer. During the pandemic, 1.1 million of our fellow Scots have become unpaid carers, and as a society, we owe them so much. Um, there is cross-party cross support across the Parliament for the extension of support for when the caring role ends due to bereavement, as well as support for when cared for people are in hospital or residential care. Can I ask the First Minister if she will commit for these potential reforms uh, to be included in the next programme for government? 
First Minister. Um, yes, I mean, we have set out. Uh, the, the first thing we need to do, of course, is uh, secure uh, the safe and effective uh, transition of this benefit so that people's payments continue. Uh, but, of course, we've also set out views on uh, priority changes uh, we want to make uh, to the benefit when it's possible to do so. For uh, example, there are five of these removing education restrictions so full time students can get the benefit, allowing carers to add together hours spent caring for more than one person. Uh, increasing the time uh, carers receive payments after the death of a cared-for person, making payments for longer uh, when a cared-for person goes into hospital uh, or care, and increasing, increasing the amount carers can earn uh, and still get support. Uh, so we are taking views on these options, and I hope uh, members across the chamber, as well as people across the country, uh, will respond to that so that we can build uh, a system here uh, that is fit for unpaid carers, because the contribution they make to our society is immense, and we owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Um, we can take brief supplementaries. Eleanor Whittam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome that the Scottish Government is planning on delivering this new benefit in a caring and compassionate way in line with our ethos, and that the Scottish Government intends to make further improvements for carers. Can the First Minister confirm how much recipients in Scotland already receive compared to carers south of the border because of the Scottish Government's carers allowance supplement? First Minister. Well, I think it's important that our social security system is based on dignity, respect and fairness um, and that we deliver the maximum support to people who most need it. I think that has been shown with our carers allowance supplement, which was the first benefit we introduced with new powers in 2018. Since then, around 126,000 uh, carers have received payments. Um, and last year, carers got uh, just under £700 more uh, than carers in the rest of the UK uh, through the supplement. And of course, uh, that included the extra payment in December to help with the impact of COVID. Um, those who have been receiving carers' allowance continuously since 2018 will have received over £2,270 more than carers in the rest of the UK in the past three years. And of course, we have also introduced a young carer uh, grant for younger carers. So that's a sign of what we can do uh, when powers lie in this parliament, which is why I want to see so many more powers come to this parliament and not lie at Westminster. I take a brief supplementary, Pam Duncan Glancy. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, last year, you doubled the Carers' Allowance Supplement to recognise the increased support that unpaid carers had to provide during the pandemic. Will you double it again this year and until you create the new Carers' Allowance? First Minister. We will consider all these things carefully. Of course, there were additional consequentials uh, made available to us uh, because of COVID, uh, which are not being continued. So any uh, moves to do that will mean that we have to take the money uh, from elsewhere in our budget. But I think I've made very clear, and I, I think people across the chamber uh, are of this view, that the debt we owe to unpaid carers is so significant that we've got to consider very seriously everything we can possibly do to help them. Question number four, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of the steps being taken to return to normality after the COVID-19 pandemic, what extra help has been provided to support people's mental health? First Minister. Uh, right throughout the pandemic, mental health has been at the forefront of our thinking. Uh, our transition and recovery plan, published in October 2020, backed by our £120 million recovery and renewal fund uh, will transform services uh, with a renewed focus on prevention and early intervention. Uh, funding already allocated includes £40 million for child and adolescent mental health services, £21 million for grassroots community groups uh, via Communities Mental Health and Wellbeing Fund for adults, and £5 million to increase capacity in the NHS 24 Mental Health Hub. Uh, looking forward, we will continue to address the mental health harms caused by COVID. Uh, the updated strategic framework commits to ensuring that improving mental health and wellbeing is an underpinning principle as we take strategic decisions. Evidence on the likely effects on mental health will also be specifically assessed as part of our future decision-making. Julian Martin. Uh, thank the First Minister for that comprehensive answer. Last month, the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee I convened finished taking evidence uh, on the health of our children and young people. And unsurprisingly, early intervention to prevent mental health issues becoming acute is mentioned frequently. And school counsellors were highlighted as a very positive move in that regard. I want to ask what more has been done to improve early intervention opportunities for those who leave the supports of school or leave care? Uh, still young people, but entering adulthood and potentially particularly vulnerable to the effects of the psychological stresses of the pandemic they've faced. First Minister. Well, can I firstly agree wholeheartedly that early intervention and prevention are central to supporting 
the mental health and well-being of children and young people. Um, in addition to school councillors uh, that Gillian Martin has referred to, this year we have provided £15 million of funding to local authorities to deliver locally based mental health and wellbeing support for 5 to 24 year olds in their communities. We have also funded the I Feel and Mind Your Time web resources, which provide information to young people on a range of mental health and wellbeing topics, uh, because we know that providing young people with good opportunities when they do leave education or care has a significant impact on their health and wellbeing. We have also uh, built this into the Young Persons Guarantee. We have provided up to £75 million to local employability partnerships via local authorities to, to provide employability support, including uh, mental health support, to young people aged 16 to 24. Brief supplementary, Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A report published today by the Mental Health Foundation highlights that mental ill health costs Scotland around £8.8 .8 billion a year, while we know referrals for psychological and mental health services have now exceeded pre-pandemic level, levels. What action is the Scottish Government taking to improve mental health prevention and reduce the time spent on waiting lists? First Minister. Um, I have set out already uh, in response to Gillian Martin uh, much of the action we are taking. We are focusing uh, much more now on early intervention and prevention. Uh, that is the case particularly for CAMS services, uh, but also for adult services as well. And we are investing uh, significantly in mental health services generally. Of course, I believe that governments have a duty, uh, as far as governments possibly can, and, uh, and this can't be done absolutely, is to remove uh, some of the, the causes uh, of mental health challenges for people, which right now will be uh, being exacerbated by poverty and the cost of living uh, crisis. So giving uh, money to people who most need it, rather than, as some other governments are doing, taking away money from people who most need it, is an important part of supporting people uh, to prevent mental health uh, difficulties that come from the worry of uh, wondering how that they're, they're going to feed their children uh, or provide in other ways. So that's an important part of the bigger picture here as well. Question number five, Stephen Kerr. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Information Commissioner's Office recently issuing a reprimand to it and NHS National Services Scotland in relation to the COVID-19 status app. First Minister. Uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, the government's continually had to make uh, tough decisions aimed at minimising transmission of the virus and helping to keep people safe and indeed alive. Uh, the NHS Scotland COVID status app is an important tool in our response to COVID and has played a vital public health role uh, during the latter stages of the pandemic. Uh, we accept the outcome of the ICO's investigation and that the privacy information notice in the app could have been made clearer uh, to users about how their information would be used. However, I must stress that at all times people's data was held securely and personal information was not compromised. Uh, together with NHS National Services Scotland, we're working with the ICO to implement the improvements on transparency they have asked for and ensure that any uh, necessary lessons are learned for future work. Stephen Kerr. Sir, the First Minister was warned, but some might say, as usual, she thought she knew better than everyone else. And an apology to the people of Scotland is in order, at very least. People trusted the Scottish Government with their personal data, but the ICO has had to reprimand the Scottish Government for misleading us about how that data would be used. This is a betrayal of trust. So why should the people now trust the Scottish Government? First Minister. Look, these are important issues, but I, I don't think anybody contributes to them by uh, grossly overstating them uh, or exaggerating them to the point of almost misrepresenting them in the way Stephen Kerr has done. Let me repeat for the, the, the reassurance of people listening to this who are actually interested in, in the substance. Uh, at all times, people's data was held securely and personal information was not compromised. What the ICO uh, has said, and the reprimand, of course, at the lower end of the sanctions that the ICO has available to it, what they've said effectively is that the paperwork could have been clearer. We could have made it clearer to users in the privacy information notice uh, about how their information would be used, and we accept that. But, you know, presiding officer, at a time when every single day governments everywhere were taking decisions to protect people, uh, from a potentially deadly virus. In this instance, yes, uh, we could have made the paperwork slightly clearer. Uh, I accept that. Uh, but do you know what? Um, I think we are taking, we're taking the right decisions to try to keep people in the country as safe as possible. Question number six, Emma Harper. 
to ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government plans to mark Eating Disorders Awareness Week First 2022. Minister. Earlier this week, the Minister for Mental Wellbeing and Social Care visited BEAT, the UK's eating disorder charities helpline service, and took part in the members' business debate for Eating Disorder Awareness Week 2022. At this, he highlighted our work to implement recommendations made in the National Review of Eating Disorder Services, including the establishment of an implementation group and investment of £5 million to support the recommendations. We have also announced further funding of over £300,000 in 2022-23 for BEAT, and this will enable additional services to be rolled out across Scotland. Emma Harper. I thank the First Minister for that answer. On Tuesday, I led the members to be on eating disorders awareness, and I highlighted that one in 50 people in Scotland are living with an eating disorder. So could the First Minister provide any additional information on what the Scottish Government is doing to improve the outcomes for people with an eating disorder, and will she join me in encouraging people who are worried about an eating disorder or who are living with an eating disorder to contact BEAT for help by calling 0808 801 0432 or by visiting BEAT's website. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I congratulate Emma Harper on uh, leading the members' debate and uh, absolutely agree with her in terms of uh, access to BEAT services. Um, and she has uh, very helpfully given the contact uh, details. In terms of the action the Government is taking, building on what I said in my Initial answer. The implementation group uh, was established to take forward the recommendations made by the review. It most recently met last Friday to discuss progress so far and uh, next steps. The implementation group has taken forward a comprehensive work plan uh, focused on training and skills, quality standards and data improvement. And uh, the Mental Wellbeing Minister is attending the group's next meeting to discuss areas where further improvements need to be made. Uh, and I would absolutely encourage anyone who feels they need support for disordered eating to seek help from friends and families, um, a medical professional or support services such as BEAT. And the additional funding uh, I mentioned in my earlier answer for BEAT uh, will allow uh, additional services to be delivered, and these include expansion of helpline support, specific binge eating disorder support services, and additional training for GPs and healthcare professionals. Question seven, Paul O'Kane. To ask the First Minister what urgent steps will be taken to address lung disease in Scotland in light of the reported comments of Asthma and Lung UK Scotland that the state of lung health in Scotland is shameful, with over 7,000 people dying a year. First Minister. Firstly, can I thank Asthma and Lung UK for their new Fighting for Breath strategy and for the very important work they do to support people with respiratory conditions. Respiratory disease is a Scottish Government clinical priority. We are committed to ensuring that people living with respiratory conditions receive the best possible care and treatment to enable them to live longer, healthier and independent lives. The first Respiratory Care Action Plan for Scotland was published last year. It sets out our priorities and commitments for driving improvement in the prevention, diagnosis, care, treatment and support of people living with these conditions. Uh, the plan also works alongside existing prevention strategies, including our air quality and tobacco strategies, uh, which help to address the root causes of lung disease. Paul O'Kane. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? And I know that she references the publication of the Respiratory Care Action Plan. Indeed, it's now one year since the publication of that plan. However, um, implementation of the plan has slowly progressed, indeed, with the creation of the Scottish Respiratory Advisory Committee. On the issue of funding of the RCAP, no commitments have yet been made. Will the First Minister um, make clear how much funding will be allocated to the implementation of the RCAP in order to improve Scotland's lung health? First Minister. Well, I can confirm that we are working closely with the Scottish Respiratory Advisory Committee, and that includes Asthma and Lung UK, to develop an implementation programme that will help us understand the funding that is required to deliver on the plan's commitments and uh, priorities. And, uh, we will make announcements about funding uh, in due course uh, as we do that work. The committee has identified three key priorities for year one, uh, which are firstly child to adult transition services, uh, secondly pulmonary rehabilitation and thirdly uh, data. We have also provided the alliance uh, with some funding to support the establishment of a lived experience uh, respiratory network. And I know the Health Secretary will keep Parliament updated uh, of further developments. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a brief pause before members' business.